me Tim and this video is a little bit different than most of mine I'm gonna focus in on a little bit of CNC stuff which I don't normally do on this channel I just sort of let it kind of fly by but if you're not interested in CNC just go ahead and skip this and if you are CNC curious um, please check this out I had this idea uh, for the way I'm gonna make a bunch of fingerboards a little bit different than I've done in the past and so I thought I'd chronicle it if not just for myself for anybody else that might uh, find this interesting so I have a whole bunch of instruments I'm making right now, and I'm doing uh, fingerboards today. I have actually four fingerboards I'm doing, but I'm only going to do three of them right now. And so there's a couple things I'm doing different. One is some different processes in um, the inlays. Uh, I'm going to, you know, I've very commonly done epoxy inlays inside, uh, you know, things that I've seen so carved out for shapes and whatnot. Um, but I'm going to try something a little bit different with it this time. And the other thing I'm going to try and do is um, you'll see on this neck here I have these little holes that I put in that are going to be hidden underneath the inlays um, and the idea being if I put holes through the fingerboard uh, that line up with these it'll keep it from slipping on me and it'll guarantee it's perfectly lined up when I'm gluing it together because that's an issue that happens sometimes uh, but I don't want to do a two-sided carve so I didn't want to have to like flip the board over and drill holes and flip it again so that's where all of this starts from and I thought I would do three at once so here's a whole bunch of CNC techniques for people that want to know CNC techniques and are they gonna work I don't know we're gonna find out together first things first you'll notice I have my three separate fingerboards uh, secured to my wasteboard of my Avid CNC I'm using two of them are rich light and then one of them is wood uh, I have all the blanks roughed out to the same size and the same height and what I've done is uh, pasted them all down, but this is not one CNC file I'm going to run. I have three separate CNC files for these three very different, very unique fingerboards, but I want to do them all together to be a little bit more efficient. So doing the masking tape and super glue kind of DIY two-sided tape trick, I have these all secured down to my wasteboard. And if you don't know that trick, there's, you can watch some more, but I think it's pretty self-explanatory in the video footage that I'm showing you right now. And now what I've done is I use Mach 4 software to control this machine. And in Mach 4 software, I can set uh, multiple offsets, which is another like kind of way of saying like home base or zero. So here, I usually use this first offset, which is where I found to be basically the dead center of my machine. And that's kind of where I start almost all my files. So if I were to click go to home, it will move my router bit to that center spot on the board. And you can see it here represented in numbers. It goes back to the same spot. But check this out. I can have multiple offsets. So what I've done is I've created two more offsets down here. One that's exactly the same location, only a few inches further toward me. And then another one that's, again, exactly the same location, but even a few inches closer. So you'll see this is if I apply this offset and I go here. Now you can see that my number is different there. Uh, go to zero now showing you on the table itself I will go to the third offset I set I'll click that one and then I'll go to that one now I want to go back to my first one so I will go back to my first one 
So what does all this nonsense mean? Simple, it means I can run multiple projects at the same time without changing end mills and whatnot. So basically what I'm gonna do is I have a bunch of operations that you'll see as we go through this that I need to do in a specific order. And if I was just doing one fingerboard, I would have to do it and then I'd have to wait and change the bits and everything. You'll see in a second. But so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do all the cuts I need with one end mill on this board, then this board, then this board, then I can stop, change end mills, do the next bit, go to the next step, and it's gonna be awesome. I actually made a couple mistakes on the first time I tried this, so this is cutting to the second time. I was going to show all the film of me making mistakes because there are some good learning experiences, but in the interest of time, I decided to just skip right to this. I think I'll still be able to use those fingerboards, though, for other projects, maybe fretless instruments. The first operation was to use an eighth inch end mill to drill those pilot holes through the fingerboards and all the way into the wasteboard so I could make my little tabs that I'll use for alignment later. One of the mistakes I made on the first pass was I figured while I had this end mill in, I would cut out my profiles, but that became a problem for my inlays, which you'll see why in a little bit. I also had a little bit of roughing to do on that one piece. I'm just using skewers that you would get at the supermarket as dowels, and they are about 0.15 inches thick. And if you cut them with a razor blade, it will break all the bamboo fibers up, so you can just snap them with your fingers if you just score that outside edge. You'll get a better, cleaner cut. The next operation is to cut out my inlays, and here I'm using a 16th inch end mill to cut out these sort of airplane shapes out of the first fingerboard. And uh, now I've moved to a 30 degree quarter inch V-bit to cut out the sort of, um, it's supposed to be like uh, paint stripes, uh, like a paintbrush sort of marked these things on. And I could have made these files more efficient. They took a little bit of time, but you can see how what I'm doing is I'm covering right over those dowels I just put in so they'll get covered in epoxy and you won't even see them. I used tinted total boat epoxy to fill in my inlays, and the one thing I didn't discuss yet is uh, this is my big idea. You'll notice the inlays on the two rich light boards, uh, they actually extend past the final profile cut of the fingerboard. So the idea that I had was if I fill them in with this epoxy and then I cut the fingerboard out, you'll actually see the inlay wrap around the edge of the fingerboard, eliminating the need to put like a side marker dot. The inlay itself will serve two purposes. The other reason I wanted to do multiple fingerboards at the same time is the epoxy needs to cure overnight, and so this way I am tying up my machine for one day instead of three days, one day per fingerboard. So the underlying principle here of this whole idea was now I have all this epoxy in and everything's all filled and I can go carve my shape again. It should all look beautiful. So I'm going to put my ball nose in and start doing the finishing tool pass that will give us the shape and then I'll do the frets last. And I'm going to cut these at a 45 degree angle, I've never done it before. But my friend Josh over at uh, I Like To Make Stuff uh, was sharing with me a bass guitar that he's working on right now. And he showed me while he was uh, cutting out his fingerboard that he was using it at 45. And I liked the idea. I think it might make cleanup a little bit easier. So I'm going to try it, see what happens. When cutting the rich light, which is a composite material, I don't think the angle matters all that much. But when cutting wood with the CNC, you know, usually I would go either the long way down the wood with the grain, which runs the risk of splintering it, or going across the grain, which then runs the risk of it getting, you know, shredded and ugly looking. So there's something about doing this 45 degree angle which makes sense. It's sort of like when you are running a hand plane over a board, you might do it at a 45 degree angle because so you're less likely to chip or splinter or get caught. So I liked that theory a lot and it worked pretty good. After running my first finish path, um, I wasn't too happy with the way the epoxy looked. It appeared to have uh, maybe melted a little bit under the heat and friction of the end mill. Um, so I knew I was going to have to do another pass, and that made me think that maybe next time I could actually do the first pass, then fill the epoxy in, and then do the second pass, which is sort of like I've done in the past, but I think that might have been a little easier. The important thing I have learned is to make sure not to cut the fret slots until all your epoxying is done. Otherwise, you end up with epoxy in the fret slots that you have to clean out again. Now, that is a 0 0.022 inch end mill that I use for cutting fret slots. It's very small, very delicate, and very easy to break. So you want to go slow with very small passes. And sometimes it does break anyways. But I did find that I can buy them in bulk used on eBay 
uh, for much less than buying them new, which seems to make sense for this because they do break so often and can get expensive. All my files are cut and they look pretty good, except for the epoxy got kind of gummy. It's probably from the friction heat of the end mill going over it. And so what I'm gonna do before I pull these up is run my final finishing toolpath one more time to see if I can clean up some of these bumps to save me some work sanding. And uh, last time I ran the, the end mill at a 45 degree angle like this, this time I'm gonna run it like that, like a cross hatch. And um, it'll help me hopefully have even less sanding to do just to get rid of some of those chatter marks or at least make them look interesting. This worked great, and that is the result I was hoping to see from this experiment. So in the future, uh, I will just plan on doing two tool paths, and I will do the epoxy after the first finishing pass, and then do the second one. And it'll just make it a little easier on cutting the shapes out, so I'm not cutting through extra material to make these very detailed shapes. Well, that was certainly worth the work and way better than sanding it by hand. So there you can see our, our placement pegs. For some reason that one's really long. I guess that hole went into another hole. <laughs> no problem. Uh, it came out good. And then that second pass really, really cleaned up these, um, these inlays quite a bit. And you can see there when I sand this edge in, there's my side markers that we were talking about also on this one. And the alignment holes worked great, which means that I won't have to worry about the fingerboard sliding around on me while I try to glue it together. Well, this has been an exciting learning experience for me because I am kind of a nerd like that. I hope you found this interesting too. So I think I need to do a little bit of thinking about how I'm gonna approach uh, doing it this way in the future, but you know, the second time worked pretty well. Uh, and now I'm going to finish these up and finish up the instruments that they're going on and get back to the hard work. So thank you all very much for watching. And uh, if you're interested in this type of content, let me know. And also, so you know, I do a lot of stuff over on Patreon that you don't get to see here, patreon.com slash timsway. So, shameless plug. Thanks a lot and be good.